Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Let's get underway. Let me just make sure I've got a couple of my drawing tools all set here. Uh, we'll start out with the current market conditions. We're still uh, working towards the upper end of this range. We are mildly bearish in this bull market. Bull market ranks sitting at 26.04. And again, what that number, this 26.04 number represents this momentum line right here. You can see, right, it's at about 2580, or at least that's the one that's visible. The number is 2604. It's starting to trend lower a little bit here. So we've seen some of the volatility recently kind of top out. Now, just as a reminder, this is a very slow moving indicator. And so a lot of the little shorter term moves in the market it it really doesn't pick those up it'll pick up major trend shifts and uh, it's and it's towards the upper end of that range so when we see these crossover points right here this arrow is essentially back here back when it turned it would have been it would have crossed the line and headed back up this direction so the other thing that we're going to be watching for now is is what is the uh, intensity of this bull market or how far extended is this current uptrend away from that zero line if we were to call this the zero line or this the zero line right here how far away are we so we know that we're extended uh, we talked we talk about that each week and that really is the current risk in the marketplace is the the advancement of this trend so we get a rally with a uh, new presidential uh, election. Some of that's kind of started to fade a little bit. Now it's going to be interest rates. We're still talking about inflation. We're still talking about CPI. We're still talking about interest rates. Those are still significant um, discussions to have. So we'll, we'll touch on those. That's part of the reason why we have the market trend. The market trend process is to start at the top down. So essentially, when you're starting out the analysis, a top down or a momentum approach is what is the overall market doing? Is the market in an uptrend? Is it in a downtrend? Uh, or is it in between? Okay, there's really no non trend and it's either transitioning into an uptrend or to an uptrend from a downtrend or from an uptrend to a downtrend or pausing an uptrend or a downtrend uh, as as well in this case we are at the upper end of this range and uh, some of the internals the buy sell ratio is a way to look at what is the database telling us about all of the stocks and the buy sell ratio is currently 0.73 so essentially 0.73 anything less than one means that the bears are in charge anything higher than one means that the bulls are in charge so if we look, were to drag over this you can see this is two uh, when it spikes up right here let me just draw that this right here this right here 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 those correspond to a to a widening green above red and when it's really low like this less than one it corresponds to a red above green so this down here is showing you what this ratio actually is how many buys do we have in relation to sales and so you can see when we mouse over this it's two two thousand to the sell side 1.4 1400 to the upside so we've got more sells than we do buys so we've got a buy sell ratio that is less than one the the advantage of understanding this or knowing this is that we want markets are nothing more than a, a group of a whole bunch of stocks and so our database is no different it's like a whole bunch of stocks and we have levels of uptrends and levels of downtrends so these buy signal stocks are in uptrends the sell signal stocks are in downtrends so this is just grabbing that and saying what does the entire database look like right now well we've got more stocks in downtrends and uptrends not by a lot uh, and it's certainly not at an extreme level but it's also not uh, conducive to really really bullish uh, a really bullish environment when everything is to the upside uh, sentiment also this is a this is a little bit shorter term indicator when we look for extremes the edges of this indicator work pretty well at at a at a reversal location so when we're at these upper ranges or at these really extreme ranges this one works pretty well to say uh, let's wait a little bit let's wait for a pullback and see what the market looks like during that pullback and oftentimes this 50 percent line across the middle here can act as support and resistance or can act in, in addition to that bullish zone so if we're above 50 percent we can say okay more than likely we are in an uptrend and it's maintaining that it may not be super strong because we know that from the buy sell ratio we also know that we're at the upper end of this trend so really those three things as of as of right there can give you some indication of 
Current market conditions, uh, I'll, I'll go through some, uh, some in, in addition to that as well, um, that sentiment. Now, the bond yield curve, this one takes us a little bit more time to to talk about and decipher. It's a quick glance, though, and the value of the bond yield curve chart is it's a long time, okay? You've got all the way back to 93, and you're looking at bond rates in relation to S&P 500, and then this is the yield curve um, spread, okay? So the 10 and two-year spread. That is basically the, dif the difference between the 10-year bond right here and the two-year bond right here. Those interest rates are they far apart? Are they close together? You can see right now they're about the same. They're very close to the same. When the two-year is higher than the 10-year, that's called an inverted yield curve. Okay, so an inverted yield curve means that it's upside down. It's supposed to be moving this direction, but when it's not, when it's moving this direction, that's called inverted. And that just means that the shorter end of the yield curve, the shorter maturity bonds are paying more interest than a long-term bond. Okay, you can see the three-month treasury uh, treasury note is paying 4.6%, where the 30-year treasury bond is paying 4.6%. Okay, so why would I tie up my money for 30 years when I can tie it up for three months and get the same rate? Okay, it's an annualized rate. All of these are annualized yields, but the point is when the Federal Reserve starts to monkey around with interest rates, they're trying to control the, um, the, uh, the ease of the money flow. So when you have a really low interest rate, it's really easy for us to go get a, you know, get a second mortgage or buy a new car or buy a new TV or whatever it is that we may be putting on credit. Uh, it's easy to do that. Same with companies. Companies, when they have really low interest rates, they're like, hey, let's, let's, you know, let's borrow a bunch of money so we can expand and we can grow. It, it promotes economic growth. Well, when that, when that happens too fast, it creates inflation. And when inflation starts to get too high, there can be other uh, unintended consequences in the economy uh, that really creates some problems. So the Fed d is focusing on inflation. And one of the ways, one of the only tools they have to control inflation is by lowering or raising interest rates. So when interest rates are really high, uh, again, in theory, it's about to slow the economy down. And it's more than theory. It actually works. We see, we've see we seen it happen over and over and over again. The problem that happens, though, is a lot of times the Fed will keep interest rates too high for too long, and it slows the economy enough to break it and to create recession. Recession is nothing more than the growth of the economy is growing at a slower pace. It's receding. It's not growing. It's actually contracting. So a recession is just simply a slowdown in economic growth. Well, increased money supply is going to do that. The Fed typically goes too far too fast or holds rates too low or too long. And the stock market pays attention to that because what is the stock market? It's just, it's just anticipating future growth or future contraction. Okay, the stock market is just a giant auction. And there is a fair value to all of these numbers. Companies have a, an intrinsic value. What is the actual value of this company? Maybe you go to book value. What's the value of the, all of just their assets? Okay, but the stock market is looking further past that and saying, we think these companies are going to grow at such and such a rate. And that's why you have multiples over and above a fair value price. Okay, that say a company's book value is 10, but their stock price is 100. The market believes there's a lot of value in the growth and in the earnings potential of that company. Well, when the market realizes that's not the case, then it starts to sell off because it's trying to create that equilibrium with growth or anticipated growth. And so there's always that ebb and flow. So when we get to these scenarios where markets start to go up like this and they start to go parabolic on a stock or on a market, we know that doesn't last. Okay, it's going to come back to a sustainable trend and it typically does in that in that amount of time, okay, straight up and straight back down. So these moves that are nice and kind of chug along like this, those are good. When they go up, we usually get a retracement. When we get a big uptrend, we get a retracement. Overall, though, the idea of the stock market is ultimately that it's going to continue to grow forever. Theoretically, it's going to grow forever. And and in, in, in all reality, it can potentially could grow forever because S&P 500, 
continually is evolving. They're adding new stocks to this index and they're getting rid of stocks all the time, okay? Several times a year typically. So there's always good growing companies in the S&P 500. The ones that are continuing, the ones that are lagging and dropping off, S&P drops them. So the S&P 500 of now is not the same S&P of 10 years, of five years ago, of 10 years ago, of 15 years ago, of 20 years ago. They're different stocks, different, that are, uh, that are in that indice. So our goal, we're looking for these kind of companies. We want this overall idea to be moving higher. What we want to be aware of is are we at the top of the trend? Are we at the bottom of the trend? Are we somewhere in between? And how does that help us allocate our funds? So from there, we can say, well, we're at the top end of the trend. My my risk tolerance is relatively low. I don't want a lot of equity exposure. So from there, we decide how, how, how big of a position am I going to have? How many how many stocks, how many holdings am I going to have in my portfolio available to me to trade? If this is a hundred thousand dollars, okay, hundred thousand dollars, then right now about 75% of that or 75 K is in cash. And the other 25 are invested at about 2% allocation in these individual names. That's uh, diversification, or that is just position size. We call that position risk or size risk, and that is how big of a position, how big, how big of a holding, how many shares am I holding in relation to my risk tolerance or my ability to to manage volatility? Well, if I bought one stock, if I bought PLTR with you know with a hundred thousand dollars of this money. Yes, you probably would make a whole lot more money because that stock is up over 100% so far. But you also run the risk of it you know, being volatile and maybe it could drop by 20 or 30% as well. So risk is, is relative to your own trading plan, your own ability and your own suitability to take on that risk and to manage the volatility. So that's why you see it index is like S&P 500. It's 500 stocks. So the, the slices of the pie of 100,000 with 500 stocks are way, way smaller. You know, le- less than a half a percent as far as allocation. So it's really, really diversified into that many names. And the reason why is because it reduces risk. It also, it also reduces potential reward, potential performance. But you know, because you may have a handful of stocks that are doing amazingly well, but you might have a handful of stocks that are doing terrible. And well, which ones do we want to buy? I don't know this or that. So it's like, let's just buy all 500 of those stocks. And when we do that, we're buying the S&P 500 index. And there are a lot of ETFs that represent that. We primarily use SPY. That's the granddaddy. It's been around forever. And so this SPY, this ETF, $591 represent 500 companies. And we can buy and sell this just like an individual stock. Okay, so now you can see it's finding some support right here. We've got a decent day going on so far, a half percent. It's retraced. It's pulled back. It's back to a demand zone. Okay, a demand zone is essentially a, a support zone zone. And that is, where did people buy and sell before? Okay, well, there was a whole bunch of buying and selling right here. We broke through that. Now, if I were if an investor or a big institution were looking to to buy more, well, where are they going to buy more? They're going to buy more at these areas where there is additional support. Maybe they had, maybe they bought a bunch of shares going into this, and they're like, "Hey, we finally get an opportunity to add more into our position." So they buy into these, and that 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 creates this support and resistance area. When you get a breakout above a, a zone, and now it becomes support, and this becomes resistance, and it breaks out of that, and then it comes back, and it creates support. And then it moves higher. Once those support areas start to break down, that trend is starting to shift. So most of the time, we're not overly concerned about the trends this direction. We are, and that's what the green is. But we're also aware of the trends side to side this direction. And that's why we have these Fibonacci lines right here, as they represent. In this case, it's grabbing just the six-month time frame. It's grabbing the high point, grabbing the low point. And now we can look to see, are we in the momentum zone? The momentum zone is above the 236, which is basically saying, we don't have a whole lot of overhead resistance. There's not a whole lot of people that are interested in selling at a level that they, um, that they may have purchased at before. 
Okay. And so these, so the, the, the path of least resistance is this direction. Okay. There, there's a lot of resistance or I should say support this direction. Once you get down here and a stock has got to move back up this way, it's got to hit this resistance and it may be in a downtrend. So it's got more work to do this direction when it's a lot deeper versus when it's already in this direction. So we want to pay attention to markets and stocks that are in that direction. S&P is still there. So we're shifting, but this is also when things start to shift and it goes back into this hold range. It's it's that area to, to analyze your risk. What does my risk look like? Do I want to take on more risk? Do I want to remove risk to my overall portfolio and the exposure that I've got? That means selling some of your positions. That means taking off some of the gains of winners. That means tightening up stops on those. That means selling your losers or tightening up stops on those losers as well, or a combination of those different things. If you're saying, I want to maintain this 25%, I've got to be able to do some different things there as well. You're going to get stopped out along the way. Some of these stocks that we start into that have not yet proven themselves in those uptrends, they, they may be turned and go the other direction. FTEL, for example, we bought this one yesterday. It immediately had this big gap higher and some reversal. Part of that is there's some resistance here. Okay, There's areas where people are buying and selling. This is going to create some resistance, but ideally it doesn't create enough resistance to push it all the way back down to this low point. And so now we're getting a little bit more support right here as it's chopping through this. Ultimately, it starts to move that direction and starts to trend or continues the trend that it's in. Okay, and that's why we're uh, oftentimes we're buying high and we're selling higher. We can certainly look for signals down in these ranges as well. Um, as the trend is beginning, and then maybe we get a big pop like this and then a pullback. But once we get some trend, that's okay. You know, it's frustrating sometimes when we miss out on some of these. We're like, oh man, I wish I would have bought it back here. Well, you know, the, the, wor the world is full, full of woulda, coulda, shoulda, especially in trading and investing. We, we always are looking at, oh man, I woulda, coulda, shoulda done this or that. And uh, there's no point in going through that process because it's it's over. Okay, what's done is done. This is history. Now we're dealing with what we're dealing with now. What can I do today that maybe will provide an opportunity to grow and protect my wealth, grow my capital, but I also want to protect it. I don't want to gamble. I don't want to just throw money at a stock and see what happens. Okay, oftentimes we still have to do that though. There's some trust in that anticipation of the direction, but we don't. We, then we manage our risk. We we can say, well, okay, this isn't an uptrend. Uh, the evidence is here that there is demand, there's increased volume, there's support here at these levels where there should be. That means people are coming back in and buying it. I say people, I mean institutions. Institutions are your hedge funds, your pension funds, your mutual funds, your, you know, your endowment funds, you, you, you name anything that's huge. And those guys have money they've got to deploy and they've got a lot of it. And that moves these stock prices and that, and that ultimately moves the market as well. So we've got to be able to pull the trigger at some point and say, oh man, well, what if, you know, what if it goes higher? What if it goes lower? That, that's what we're dealing with. We don't know what it's going to do, but we want to trust some of that evidence that it's going higher. It's a high rank. It's been moving higher. In addition to that, we also maybe go back, pull out this time frame by a little bit longer. Now we're looking at a one-year time frame, and the and the perspective looks even more attractive, to where yes, it's a very volatile name. It's moving higher. This is in the um, this is in the fitness space. It says machinery and electrical and industrial, but it's actually in uh, fitness equipment, and uh, so it's doing quite well. And it's having to run po possibility for more upside. Uh, in that name, but some early volatility in that as it's happening here. So the places to start out when you're looking is essentially starting out looking at your market conditions. We know the, the market conditions are elevated. We know we have a bond yield curve issue, which means, you know, we know that the Fed is trying to manage inflation, but is that affecting the economy? So far, so far, so good. The, they, you know, they, the, the uh, profitability numbers are decent. The Employment numbers are decent. The CPI numbers are de decent. This is that gold. They call it a Goldilocks economy or a Goldilocks scenario. And that's not too hot, not too cold. Just it's just right. It's just in the middle. And that's what the Fed tries to balance when they're when they're playing around with interest rates and 
um, you know, they, they may have caught it right here. We'll, we'll see what happens. But the market nonetheless is still elevated, but it's still trending higher. We don't want to throw it out yet, uh, but we do want to make sure we're allocated to associate with that risk that we're taking. Okay. Um, there is another strategy to utilize, and that is the the muscle 10 or 20 strategy. And that is this one here. That is owning 20 stocks that are all high rank stocks all at the same time. Okay. So this is a, this is a strategy I haven't covered much in these sessions, uh, but it's one that we'll start tracking a little bit because it's, it's actually a fun one. It's, it's a good one to, it's a little bit easier to ma maintain and manage, although it creates a lot of volatility. Okay. And that is you're using, I've got other trainings regarding this, but you're essentially using a really, really wide 50% stop and you're going on the signals alone. So you're willing to have some of these names like this on some of these stocks that are really high flyers because there's, there's opportunity here. But there's also risk in getting stopped out prematurely. So if we set a really deep stop loss and have a smaller position and allow it to do a, have a lot of volatility here, okay, then with and, the, and then we're diversified across 20 of those top names. So we've got 20. Essentially, we've got all you know these high-ranking stocks that have buy signals. And it's and if you were to look at the muscle stocks group right here, it's essentially the top 20 of this list right here. So you're continually focusing on the muscle stock group, but you're not using a stop loss or you're, I should say you're using a 50% stop. So it is a really volatile um, um, strategy to utilize, but, but that's okay because oftentimes these stocks are volatile, but they are heading that right direction. They're moving in that direction. SMR. Okay. You're seeing this, this uh, from $11 to 26. Well, if this were to retrace even all the way back here and we're using two, three, six stop loss retracement, we're probably going to get stopped out versus waiting for it to give us an actual sell signal. Uh, and, it's going to be a little bit wider stop loss, but there are going to be scenarios where it doesn't stop out and it does move higher. So the possibility for more upside versus the risk of the downside. So we're managing it with position size. Okay, instead of stops, we're managing it with position size. And in this case, you can see in this portfolio, they're equally allocated across this 100,000 in 20 stocks with about 5,000 each. Okay, and you can see there's a, several, this is just a few days old that we've just started this. And we've got a handful that are up, you know, 20, 30% and a handful that are down a little bit, 20, 30%, not, not quite that bad, but there are some that are in that retracement area as well. This is called a muscle 20. If you want 10, then you're just, again, you're taking a little bit more risk because your position size is going to be bigger. But that 20 number works pretty well. Now, this doesn't have to be your full account. This can be uh, 10,000 of your 100,000. So you can still use this strategy with a portion of your in, 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 uh, overall account. That's, again, that's trade. Uh, decide that with your trading plan, how that's going to work. How do I want to manage these stocks as well? Um, I've got trainings in here. If you go to into the learning center and you go into this tro training, where is it? It's actually this one, the step by step. It talks about down here, we talk about the muscle five and 10. Okay. I would stretch that out to 20 as well, but you can do it with however many uh, positions that you want to have focusing on these real high flyers because they are these, you know, stocks like root this, this stock, you know, it was, if we look at the one year time frame on this back here, it went from 15 to 80 retraced again, back to 40, back to a hundred. It's a really volatile name and a little bit tougher to trade in terms of the volatility, but owning on owning some of those names and then just managing the risk a lot wider, managing the position size. How big of a position do I have in relation to my overall portfolio? That's referred to as uh, the muscle 10 or muscle 20 methodology. Uh, let me see. Let me come back. That's again, that was just kind of a short overview. If you want a little bit more on that, you can go in there. This, this training actually is getting a little bit aided in here. Now I need to go in and review some of those, but the concepts are exactly the same in terms of what to do and why just some, obviously some of the ticker symbols are going to be slightly different where, where am I headed here? Let's see. Let's jump back to that. Let's go through another example and take a look at uh, again, a trade setup. If I was focused on a trade and I said, this is a stock in momentum 
this is my time frame here, pre-market. I want to set up a trade. What's my risk? Okay, if I'm going with the wheel methodology, then I'm going hundred thousand. I'm going ten percent, uh, um, or not to ten percent. I'm going ten shares. That puts me at two point four percent. Two point four percent. If I want more risk than that, I'm taking more shares. Right. If I want less risk than that, I'm taking less shares. So right now we're right around two percent. Uh, so eight shares would put us right at that level. And a stop loss location for this is going to either be at these lows. If you want a little bit wider stop loss, go to the 382 here, go to that 230 number. That's going to prevent a situation like this to where if we do dip back down, but ultimately it's still not uptrend, it doesn't prematurely stop out. So if you want a wider stop and you want to adjust your risk for that, then you can say, what does my risk look like at 230? So I've got 230, that's 0.36. So that's slightly higher than that 0.3 or 0.2 number that we want. So maybe I drop my shares down just a little. Maybe I drop them down even a little more. That puts us at less than 0.3. That's a really wide stop. So a really wide stop to be able to have that risk profile, I've got to have a smaller position. Okay, that puts me at 1.4%. So if I had, if I wanted to maintain my eight shares and keep my around my 2%, I may have to come up a little bit on my stop loss from 230, maybe to this 244 number. If I go 244 right here, 244, that puts me at that uh, 0.27 risk, but keeps my position size a little bit higher. Okay, so these a lot of these sessions we're primarily talking about position size and, and stop loss, and really that's the, the two things that we have control over. We don't have control over what the stock does um, at, at all, ever. Uh, but what we're looking for is we're looking for high probability locations. We're looking for high probability stocks that are already in momentum and that they're, that that are continuing or should continue that direction. We're just looking for that entry as it's transitioning from the yellow back into that confirmation bar green, which means it's back into a trending uh, a structure. And that's ultimately what we want for these stocks. I'm going to end on that note. Uh, appreciate your time and effort and we'll see you next time. Have a great day today.